Hey, what's happening, everybody? Good morning. Hello, ladies everybody. And gentlemen, and everything in between. We are here once again. <laughs> <laughs> on the, well, drummer's education, the drummer's education connection my name is jeremy steinkohler i'm here with my three dear friends excellent comrades and monster drummers and master educators okay. chip ritter down in arizona bart robley socal rick stojak san diego welcome to the drummer's education once again we do this podcast this video cast every week tuesdays 11 a.m pacific time and it's something we look forward to every week we always get into some really great conversations about drumming, about teaching, about performing, about education, about, you know, following your path, figuring out your path. So today we are going to have a roundtable discussion talking about what it means to go pro um, or make the decision that you're going to be a drummer for the rest of your life um, in some way. That's oh, I thought we were going to talk about GoPro cameras. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I totally screwed <laughs> up. Yeah, we, we can talk about the various <laughs> GoPro models. Um, you know. um, and the, the, the first thing to talk about really is what, what does it mean to GoPro? Because I know that has a different meaning for different people, right? So, right. so Bart, Chip, Rick, why don't you guys jump in? What does it mean to go professional? And what was your, what was, uh, your story in terms of making that leap where you decided, oh, this is something I'm going to do that's going to be sustainable for, for a living for me? Chip? Well, my my version of going pro was to be in a, a famous rock star in a bus touring around the world making millions and millions of dollars. That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought yeah. Going pro was awesome. Going to be. And, Are uh, you that hiring? Was, that, see, that was the goal. <laughs> that was the goal for me. You know what I mean? Um, I know that drumming was my passion, that I definitely wanted to be a drummer since I was eight years old. I didn't know how to become a drummer. I just knew that I wanted to be a drummer and that drove me with the passion to keep going and practicing and playing. I eventually got into school bands and talked to different instructors and, and my teachers and they talked about going to college and, and right out of college, I got into a touring rock band and, uh, and I didn't go to college. I just played the drums and did my thing. And, you know, I, I went through a, a dark phase of my life where I was, using alcohol and drugs for a long time. And then that slipped away from me. And I finally got sober and clean and sober. And I picked it back up and I said, this is definitely what I want to do. So I started doing, you know, going to open jams and talking to people and getting a couple gigs here and there while I worked at big A auto parts, driving auto parts. And, you know, I had a lot of jobs that supplied my vision, helped, uh, they, they helped fund the expedition to trying to go pro and eventually I landed enough gigs and I started working enough and I started teaching and it started to become my main source of income and then it was my only source of income and I hence became a professional drummer that way. Awesome. Yeah. So did you, did you have a moment where you sort of thought to yourself, I've arrived, I'm now a professional drummer? Uh, yeah, I think I did. Once I started teaching and, and being able to teach and play gigs, I felt like that was pretty mm -hmm. much it. I was, I was earning it, earning income and able to pay my rent and my bills. That's so awesome. for you, the balance was between playing. So you had the gigs going, but it wasn't enough just by itself. So the teaching was able to subsidize the, the lifestyle kind of thing. Well, I, I, I toured with the blues band and that was my, my only source of income. And I was just touring with them and Long John Hunter in uh, Russia, Romania, U.S., wow. Canada, all through the U.S. And I did that for two years. And, uh, you know, I guess the first time I felt like a professional drummer was I was on a cruise ship playing in a country band and I lived mm -hmm. on the cruise ship. And so that was paying all my rent and my utilities and everything were covered. So I guess that was the moment I felt I was pro. Plus, you got to get to the waffles buffet, right? I had to get yeah. to the 24-hour pizza and, and ice cream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's when you know you're pro. Your free hey, waffles, what, you know you're pro. What, what country? <laughs> what country? You said a country band. Like, what country? It was, it was <laughs> country music. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't you hear him? He played Romanian music, man. Yeah. You know, that was, <laughs> that was, I was... It was a lot, I, 
I was, it was a lot with different than I thought it was going to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. I underestimated country music as a drummer, but that's a whole other story. Oh, yeah. Right? Well, that sounds like that's a good, a good story. story, though. Rick, that's how about you, man? What, what, when did you feel like you sort of uh, reached that level where you felt like you're a professional player? Or, yeah, what did that look like for you? Okay. Well, you know, I, I had a burning desire to play drums all the time as a teenager. And, and my brother played guitar. He was five years older and he got me into it. And um, we kind of played punk new wave stuff. Uh, we were playing in New York city and we, we played at CBGB, my first gig mm. at 16. Wow. And, you know, I was, That's I was awesome. pretty, pretty fired up, you know? And then, and then in high school, we had a, a production company that was recording us in New York city. Um, it's really high end, recording you know if you were to pay for that you'd spend fifty thousand dollars with all the studio time that we, we racked up and um so we thought we were going to be rock stars and so you know it, it looked good i mean the music sounded really really good and um obviously this production company was investing us so they were going to take those demo tapes to record labels they'd be ready to press um so I was all fired up, but we're playing original music. There's no money in it. So, of course, right away, I had to have a job. So I made that choice. I need to be involved in this band because this band's going to make it. I had no – I knew it for a fact that it was going <laughs> to, but I was wrong. <laughs> the, band, the band didn't make it. So I had to have this – I had this day job. We we were busy with the band, so it wasn't like I was going to go out and play covers. And I really wasn't like a cover band guy anyway. I didn't really – I didn't want to make a living, you know, playing, working for the weekend in the local bar. I wanted to create, right. create, you know? Yeah. And, and so sadly, you know, the production company fell apart, band members left that were vital and, and, and the band never popped. So there I was, uh Oh, we're not going to be rock stars. Damn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, um, so, you know, I just worked jobs. I worked day jobs and then continued to take drum lessons and continued for over a decade to try to make that original band work. And it never really, it never really popped. We moved, you know, we moved um, from Connecticut to San Diego to be kind of like in the Southern California music scene. And um, I think there's a lot of players who think that, wow, we're really, really good. So I'm going to make a living off of this. And, and what you realize is that there's not a lot of money for almost everybody. So you're going to have to have some sort of side <clears throat> income to support that. That's if you want to play your own, your own music. And um, so, you know, eventually I started getting into teaching and, um, and I had my day job and I was balancing playing, um, teaching, and, and my day job. So it was really, really exhausting. Um, it went on for years like that, you know, but I, you know, I, I had to have, a, a, you know, at least, a, you know, I wanted medical insurance. I wanted spending cash. I realized mm -hmm. that being a musician, I had to invest. I had to invest in gear and rehearsals and mm -hmm. lessons and, and that it cost money to actually try to get this career going is, was, was what my yeah. experience was. Right. So, you know, eventually, I had so many students that I took the plunge to long story. Um, but, but I felt like, okay, I'm stable enough where I don't have to have a day job. And, and that was in my forties. So I just stuck to it. And, and I'm just so glad that I did all of it because I was able to pull from all the, all of the, the skills that I've developed in the workforce, you know, it was all sales and mm -hmm. marketing stuff I did. And I use that to this day, all of the skills. Mm -hmm. You know, that I, that I learned with my day job, I apply to my music career. So there's nothing wrong with having a job, I think, and then having music. And then, you know, eventually, yeah, you're, you know, hope, perhaps taking the plunge is the thing to go full time. But you could still have a really happy and fulfilling life without, you know, trying to do this as a living and it doesn't make you any more valid whether you have as a player, whether you have a day job or, or don't have a day job. Mm -hmm. So um, that that was my path. But there's a lot of people who are just going to, hey, I'm just going to.
go for it and sleep on the couch, sleep in a car. I don't want a day job. I don't want to be distracted um, with a day job. So it's something to definitely think about. It's harder and harder to make it these days. There's less and mm -hmm. less money. Um, I mean, I'm one Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a million drummers. I, I just think having a backup plan is a really, really good idea because usually the backup plan can, um, you can use that to help you along the way as a drummer. So, yeah, but, but, you know, stick to it. I mean, I did it in my forties. I'm just so glad that I, that I did. I'll never, never turn back. A big part of it is, is that I love to teach. So I think if you're going to, make the plunge like i'm gonna make it as a musician you need to be really really diverse in how you're gonna you know create income streams so mm -hmm. what about you bart when did you when did you say that's it i'm gonna become a pro player you know it's it? about really it's about kind of the same time my late my late 30s um early 40s is when i quit my my day job mm -hmm. um my day job was I, I worked for a great company called Orange County Speaker. And so it was in the music business and uh, we, we um, uh, repaired speakers, you know, and so I was always around the music business and stuff. And I, I learned a lot at that, at that job about sound and sound reinforcement and, you know, EQing and compressions and, and all that stuff. So I, I learned a lot there and I was very thankful for that. Um, but I kind of got to a point where it was kind of the same thing. You know, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make my, my living as a musician. And, um, so I decided to quit my job. And, uh, I remember for a while, you know, you call it a leap of faith because, you know, Hey, am I going to be able to do this or not? And, um, and I remember about a few years into it, I was like, man, why did I quit my, my day job? It was such a great place. And, you know, you, hindsight's always, always twenty twenty. Well, then I come to find out that they, you know, a friend of mine that worked there called me and they were going out of business. And, and so I was like, wow, okay, now I'm glad that I, that I had quit because I had built my, my teaching clientele up quite a bit. And uh, I'd been teaching drums since I was, uh, uh, you know, I was in, I was in high school, but like right after high school, I worked at the music store and I always given lessons here and there. And I realized that I was, I, I enjoyed it and that I, um, I could convey a thought to a student so that they could break it down and, and I could break down coordination ideas and stuff like that. And, um, I was like, I was just like you guys, you know, all of us, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to have a, have a jet with my name painted on the side of it and a tour bus. And, <laughs> and you know, I oh, yeah. actually, I wanted, I wanted to be like evil Knievel. I wanted two jets with my name on the side of it so I could fly <laughs> along beside and see my name on the other jet, you know, <laughs> but no, I, I, you know, you know, after years go by and you kind of start realizing that, you know, OK, the the arena isn't isn't going to happen for me. I'm not going to play the Enormo dumps and make billions of dollars and all that sort of stuff. Um, it, it, it's uh, being able to teach and 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 is so awesome because I really do enjoy it. And I also really enjoy, uh, and I can't speak for you guys, but I, I kind of feel that you guys get the same charge that I do out of, out of seeing somebody else reach their goals and, mm -hmm. and somebody else getting better at, at the craft of playing drums. And then um, last but not least, I remember when we very first started the deck, I remember we were talking about, you know, how, how sometimes people will say, well, those who can't uh, do teach and, and chip chimed in right away. And I think, first of all, that's a bunch of crap because, you know, Peyton Manning, Eli Manning and their father have the Manning quarterback training camp and they go there and they teach how to be quarterbacks. Michael Jordan has the Michael Jordan basketball cap. He teaches how to be a basketball player, Kevin Costner and, and, and Jeff Goldblum have teaching classes that they uh, or acting classes that they teach. So those who can do 
do teach, you know, and we yes. can have examples and examples and examples. Um, last little thing I'll, I'll yes. clean up with is I think you do have to be able to wear a lot of hats. I think yeah. you got to be able to teach. I think you got to be able to play gigs, uh, do recording sessions, understand how to engineer and nowadays you know, produce yourself in a recording session. You know, you got to wear a lot of hats, but it is very rewarding, I think. I think it's very rewarding. Jeremy, back to you. What about you? How did you, what did you? Well, just, just to finish up on your thought, Bart, not to mention the hats of being a web designer and a writer and a promoter and a, yep. you know, a scheduler and all those sort of life tasks that we take for granted that are involved in being a musician because you've got so many different balls you're juggling in the air at any given time. You know, you've yeah. got to, you've got to, in order to succeed, you've got to wear a whole bunch of different hats. Yeah. Um, as we all do and all have. So for me, you know, I, I know we've talked to a lot of drummers on this show who said, oh, when I was seven years old, I knew yuck, I, I, drums were for me and that was my passion. I was going to do that for the rest of my life. And I didn't have it like that. Um, even when I was in college, you know, I went and I got a degree in literature. I got a BA and when I was a freshman at the University of Michigan, I, I went ahead and got the application of Manhattan School of Music, which is like the place to go study jazz drumming. And um, I filled it out and I had it all ready to send to transfer to apply to music school. And I decided not to send it. And it wasn't because I knew I didn't want to be a drummer, you know, and make money or be a pro or make a living. But I just thought, well, I don't know what the future holds. And you know, I can always play drums without going to music school and maybe a BA is from a good university is a good thing to have just to fall back on in case of who knows what. So I decided not to apply to music school. I have no regrets about that. Um, not that I'm down on music school, but just for me, that was the right path. And then when I got out of college, I was I was ready to, you know, enter the world. And it was like, well, OK, what do I want to do. And there were things that I was interested in. And, you know, I had been drumming since I was 10 years old and, you know, love playing drums. And I thought, you know, it's time for me to really put my, put my, all my chips in on, on music because I've always thought about it, but I've never been like super serious other than, you know, playing in my high school bands and stuff. And uh, I mean, I played a bunch of bands, but uh, I decided I want to give it a full shot. So, uh, and, and also when I was in college, I had picked up a handful of odd students teaching some lessons. Um, and that was a nice, nice way to make money. So when I moved out to California, I had some odd jobs for a little while, but, tried to build up my teaching practice, try to meet some musicians, get some gigs. And they kind of developed kind of contemporaneously the, the teaching and the gigging. Um, and like, you know, like when I'd go play gigs, you know, I'd make 50 bucks, 75 bucks a night. But when I would teach lessons, when I was first starting out, it'd be like 50 bucks an hour. So, you know, it was nice to have the teaching to subsidize the gigs, but I always felt like, and I still feel like there's got to be a balance for me. Like there's got to be enough gigs to make me feel like that. Cause that's a lot of my, pa I have passion for both teaching and for playing, but mm -hmm. if I'm all, if I'm all teaching and no playing, I'm, I'm antsy and I'm frustrated and my, my creative outlet isn't, isn't being fulfilled. And, and I'm all clapping for you. what's that? And people aren't clapping for you. <laughs> oh wait you guys don't get your students clapping with you after the lessons <laughs> um i actually do have have this guy yeah he claps yeah. Right? <laughs> like really sweet asian guy i'd clap after every lesson too so. oh, yeah I would, you know i was just gonna say if i could go to rick's studio and take a take a lesson every week i'd stand up and scream too man. <laughs> yeah, Rick, oh! <laughs> but i hear what you're saying jeremy yeah, yeah. it's a balance for me you know i need I, I feel like they're yeah. both really really important yeah. to me like when i when i decided i was going to go to, to like really give it a shot playing music it was about playing music but it wasn't until i started teaching that i discovered that i had a passion for that too and that it was something i was good at and that i enjoyed so much and was really rewarding so you know for me that like i, I think of myself as an artist educator I think of you guys as artist educators and that's, you know, in today's world, that's, that's most musicians are that because unless you're part of the lucky half of 1% that are making a living just playing, which is really, really hard to do these days um, or ever, um, you know, you got to have different irons in the fire. And for some of us, it's about teaching because that's what we love to do. And that's what we're good at. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah, I don't I, know. I also the, the think way. that you have to, uh, you know, with you, like, oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. I didn't mean to cut no, you no, off. Go ahead, Bart. Go ahead. I, I think that, um, you know, with the, um, some of the, some of the guys that have made it to like, we we were all saying, you know, the rock star status, mm -hmm. you know, and they, and they, they were lucky enough to, to get that dream that they wanted fulfilled. I don't, and I, I don't want to sound really bad when I say this, but I've heard one of my favorite drummers. Uh, I went to see him in clinic one time and somebody asked him, you know, do you give lessons? And he was like, oh, my God, I would feel sorry for anybody that took lessons from me. You know, because I, I don't, you know, and and I think that I, I've heard a few people that are, you know, that have played on multiple hit records and and make a living as a touring rock star, if you will, drummer have said that, you know, I think there's a certain there you you have to be able to convey what it is that you do, whether it be through reading or what have you. And some drummers can't do that. How do you guys feel about that? I mean, is that oh, 100%. something? 100%. I mean, I've, I've taken lessons with, you know, some of the great drummers who've come through the Bay Area. And I can tell you, a lot, you know, a lot of them are not good teachers. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, you think, oh, this person's got, they're such an amazing player. They got so much going on. I can learn so much from them. Well, mm -hmm. you, you know, most of what you can learn is by watching and listening, you know, and not so much yeah. talking to. Um, yeah, it's, it's a I say to my there's a completely different skill set, completely yeah. different, and not everybody's good at both. I say to I say to students all the time that I've I've had the great fortune of studying with some amazing drummers and taking some great drum lessons, and I say I have had the great fortune of taking uh, some really crappy drum lessons <laughs> and, and, and knowing what not only not to teach but but knowing what mm -hmm. I kind of what skill set I have to have so then. Right in turn I, I i have to improve on that because there's going to come a point in time when a drummer's like hey i really want to learn us learn about felonious monk and you're like uh okay right. you know and and so you know yeah a lot of yeah, people i think well, teach oh go ahead chip no i was just going to say some of the most famous drummers i've gotten lessons from seem to lack the patience and the empathy it takes to teach right. Yep. Because it's like, you know, I was like going with this one guy and I'm like, break this down for me. Can you break that down for me? He's like, and he played the lick again. And I was like, can you, can you deconstruct that? Can you show me how to do that? And he's like, I just did. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> I need, you to, yeah. I need right. you to slow that down and show me where, where, what goes where, you know? And, and he wasn't able to really do that. I've had that happen before too with yeah. with a famous drummer that you know you were like oh I'm going to learn from this guy and they and they were killer I mean it was they played fantastic but yeah chip exactly how did you do that well I went you know and you know, well, <laughs> right I didn't I don't need to pay you to do that I could just listen to it you know yeah if, right you're not exactly. going to break it down and show it to me and yeah, I, I, I think it's it's not the best idea in the world to teach drums if you don't like teaching drums. I don't think right. that it's fair to For the sure. student. Um, yeah. right. You actually could could create a situation where where they're turned off by music, which would be a real, real, real shame, potentially. Right. Right. Um, so I, I one thing I think a lot of people are like, well, I'd like to teach. So they think they have to teach a certain way, maybe the way they were taught. Yeah. 20 years yeah. ago. Well, how people right. learn 20 years ago might not be the right. same way you learn today. Yes. Um, Good point. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, they think, oh, I have to teach people to play a drum roll. It's like, no, you don't have. And, and I hate teaching drum rolls. Well, hmm. you know, you don't need to start lessons with drum rolls. I know some, you know, by the book teachers feel they have to do that. But, you know, I've had a lot of luck. Like, here's. Right. Here's 10 songs that do that. And so that's mm -hmm. fun. That's fun. And people get excited about that. So that's all I know how to play. You just took my whole gig, man. Uh, you know, I, I tell students enjoy that you can only play basic because all the stuff yeah. you're going to start figuring out is just going to be stuff that is going to get in the way. Just, yeah, yeah. you know, right. start right. with pocket, start with start with groove you're gonna have fun like 
Somebody well, said there are two lessons. I'm like, now start jamming with people. They're like, but yeah. I've only played for two lessons. I'm like, you could, you know, five beats. Now go find a guitarist and lay down those five beats. Right, right. right. Nice, nice. And then they got fire in their belly and they're all excited about drumming. And then they're like, you know, I think I want to put that effort into learning the flamma bar to diddle diddle. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Grab yeah. your stick. You know, uh, uh, one, one point I want to make, go if ahead, I may, is just that, you know, we, we talk about, we, we, we call this, uh, this episode going pro and taking the leap of faith, but you know, sometimes you can make the decision in your mind that this is something you want and you're passionate about it and you, you know, you know, you can see the end goal where you want to end up, but just by making that decision doesn't mean that things start happening for you right away. Right. So you have to, you have to remember that it's a process and it takes time mm -hmm. to build yourself up as a player. Obviously it takes time yeah. to build up your reputation in a, in a local area as a, as a guide to hire. Um, it takes time to make connections and, you know, it's a process that takes a lot of patience and perseverance and you got to do it because you're loving it. And like Rick said, yeah. in the meantime, there's no shame in, in, in doing whatever you need to do to make ends meet. I mean, right. is the drummer who plays weekend gigs, you know, with the band who's got a day job, any less professional than the one who's sleeping on a couch five nights a week playing, you know, 75 bucks for 75 bucks, 75 bucks a night, you know, right. the pro, the word professional is kind of meaningless in a way, in a way. Right. I mean, if you're right. making a living yeah. doing what you do, and 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 it all involves music then and you're playing gigs and you're teaching and or you're playing studio jingles or whatever you know you're doing it you're doing it so what? i have a question for you guys oh well, go ahead go ahead go ahead what do you how do you approach the student who says i want to make it as a drummer like what oh, yeah. what what do you yeah, like how mm. what what's your approach? Like and and they have no idea that that gigs pay a lot of gigs pay a hundred dollars. Right. And you have to consider that, oh, the cost of living is gonna be four thousand dollars a month. Right. But right. they're like, This is what I wanna do for a living, or parents saying that, you know. What what do you guys offer offer to, to people? I tell them place? what we're talking about here today, <clears throat> and that is that you know, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats. If you want to, if you want to be a professional musician, professional drummer, you know, go for it. There's nothing stopping you from doing it other than, other than, you know, your own self doubt, but you, you have to, and, and that's why I was going to say a minute, what I was going to interject is let's, let's talk about like a, an area of, of recording sessions or going to you know writing because we're all writers also i'm i've I, I don't know about you guys but i've i've written columns for classic drummer magazine i'm a columnist um uh you know you you have to wear those hats you know uh my buddy dan dawes says that you know some days you're a drummer some days you're a plumber and mm -hmm. i love that because there are times when you you have to wear those other hats so Playing drums and being on stage in front of people is a very, very, very small part of it. You know, yeah. being able to, you know, like Jeremy said a second ago, network and make a name for yourself as playing live, as playing sessions, as giving lessons, as, oh, you need an article on, you know, your new practice pad for a, uh, for a website. Well, you know, Call Rick. He's a great writer. He can he can really explain how this practice pad works, you know, and and know that you're not going to make a mint off of that article. But every little bit that you make contributes to, um, you know, the bottom line. Wear a lot well, of hats. And, that's, and everybody, that's my advice. And, you know, and, and uh, that's good advice. And yet still, there's got to be drummers out there. We know there are who don't wear a lot of hats. Right. And they're still right. you, you can be successful wearing one hat. It's absolutely right. possible. Right. Um, for us, it's meant wearing a lot of hats. And I think, right. you know, that's, yeah. that's part of, you know, that is my advice also for being successful is you got to wear all the hats and be good at all these things. And, uh, but it's also possible if you're really, really fortunate, you know, to just play, um, you got to be really, really, really good and really, really lucky and put yourself in the right position to be lucky and things have to go your way. So as far as practical advice, yes. You know, and that and that's kind of you're asking, Rick, what do I tell my students who say they want to be professional drummers? I say, well, 
you better really love it. You know, yeah. if this is something you're thinking yeah, about doing exactly. for any other reason, but because you're fully in, into it and passionate about it, get a day job and do this on the side. It's way less pressure. You can enjoy playing more. You don't have all the, you know, stress of having to make a living by just hustling gigs and playing. But whatever you do, whether it's balancing it like we do with teaching and writing books and publishing and doing other things, clinics, or just playing, you you know, if you're going to go that route, you really better just love it so that you're getting the rewards of being loving, have the, having the passion manifested in the work you do. And I kind of feel like if, if that's where you're at, the money will come. You'll figure out a way to make it work. Right. Um, yes. But if, yes. if you don't have that, you know, you're going to be, you know, the, the, the likelihood of your being, you know, poor and, and struggling is very high, whether you have the passion or not. So right. at least if you're passionate about it, you're loving what you're doing and that's its own reward. But if you're not, then you're, you're doing something that you're not fully invested in and you're not making a lot of money and living a squalid lifestyle. What for? Right. right. Yeah. You know, and there are Jeremy, I agree, man. And all those players who, who are like, I just want to do it by playing. I just want to be a player. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying. You've got to have the passion. I think to the point of where you know in your heart, there's nothing else that I was meant to do in this right. world right. than to drum my heart out and just be a player. And that's what I want to do because I have no choice. That's when it's like, well, okay, go for it with your eyes open that, right. Right. that right. Exactly. what's involved yeah, and be you... willing to sacrifice. Like, no, so that's Gene Hoagland. That's my brother-in-law. Right. You know, right. high school, got a record deal. You know, how does Gene be like one of these greatest drummers in, in the world? Well, that's all he's ever done. He's never had a day job. Right. You know, you know, he, he had that. I'm sleeping on people's couches, you know, mm -hmm. living, living. Was gig, gig. Sacrifice. Right. Yeah. yeah. Willing to make that sacrifice. So, so it, it can be done, but you have to be careful about yeah. about the expectations so right yeah, exactly um, right. you know and not i'm not going to be a bummer i don't want to be a bummer here but um no it's you're not being a my bummer. brother just, my brother my brother was one of those guys right. his motto was if it ain't music it ain't s-i-t you know and that's all he wanted to do and it didn't work out yeah. and you know and you know he ended up taking his own life you know, I don't oh. mean to be a bummer, but, you know, that's why when people like, hey, I'm going to do this for a living and I'm not going to go to college and wahoo, look at how fast my feet are. I'm like, whoa, let's really, really talk about this. This is serious, serious stuff. How yeah. are you going to pay your medical, man? Right. You know, yeah. so. Chip, what were, you gonna, what were you going to say, Chip? Sorry, Chip. I was just going to say there's a story of a friend of mine, uh, New Gene Krupa. And he, he said he went backstage to see Gene Krupa on one of his final gigs. And he, he was his old teacher. And he was letting him know that he's going to become a professional drummer. He said Gene grabbed his shirt and pushed him up mm -hmm. against the wall. And he said, if you don't absolutely love this, get out now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, That's yeah. a great story. Hey, guys. Uh, great advice. Um, that is, yeah, it's a good story, too. Um, D David Betts, who's a longtime listener and friend of the friend of the deck, puts up. He asks a good comment. He says, "Mr. Miyagi tells Daniel, this is from the Karate Kid movie. For those of you who uh, are too young to recognize, uh, there's no such thing as a bad student, only a bad teacher. Is this true, Mr. Mi what Mr. Miyagi is trying to emphasize is the importance of good teaching. What are you guys' thoughts about that? Is there such a thing as a bad student, or is it just a bad teacher?" <sighs> There's some bad students. I think great in the I, movie. <laughs> uh, I I do agree with I, I agree with uh, that thought process in in this in the fact that you can uh, if a student really wants to learn uh, and, and the teacher uh, and they're having trouble learning something as a teacher you need to come at it at a lot of different angles sometimes for somebody yes. to really get something yeah. and sometimes you have yeah. to literally break it down to one note at a time mm -hmm. as far as there's no bad students um i think that 
I think that sometimes, uh, and I'll put it in this one and I'll leave it alone. I've had, I had a student one time tell me that, uh, and it, it, this has only happened to me three times, but I had a student one time tell me I'm only doing this because my mom wants me to. And because all I do is play video games. And the mom had told me the same thing. And she goes, and he doesn't have a lot of energy. And I feel that drumming would give him a lot of energy. I've had some people say, my kid has a lot of energy. And we wanted to burn mm -hmm. him off in drumming. But this particular lady said, we want him to uh, get some energy. And the kid was a young kid, six years old, seven years old. And he sat down right in his first lesson, looked me in the eye. And he said, "I'm while I'm here, I'll try. But. I don't want to do this. I'm doing it because my mom wants me to. And I was like, okay, well, I can get through to anybody. Well, three lessons in and they paid me for four. I was like, you know, he was right and I'm wasting my time. And so I, I cut the strings. Yeah. So it, the student has to want it, you know, the student does have yeah. to want it, but, it, uh, but one of my star students, the kid was struggling so bad. He just couldn't, get it that he could i remember him learning rick talked about roles he couldn't get a stick to bounce and this kid went on to be one of the greatest drum teacher one of the greatest students i ever had and he by the time he quit taking lessons with me he could drum me under the table and this kid wanted it and he and he was he was phenomenal so yeah i i don't know there's both sides to the coin i guess yeah well bart you said that the kid has to the student has to want it but do you yeah. think it's possible that a student can come to you not wanting it, but then you as a teacher can help encourage them and motivate them into wanting it. Yeah, I, I definitely do. I, yeah. I definitely think that can happen. And then, but it always comes back to what I say. I think that, that um, mo uh, motivation will get you so far. Every time mm -hmm. I get off the deck, I'm motivated to set up my studio like Rick Stowe Jackson and flip mm -hmm. my drumsticks like Chip Ritter and work on jazz <laughs> like Jeremy Steinkohler. But it's the, but it's the determination to sit down yeah. and do those things. Right. Determination right. and motivation are two completely yeah. different things. Right. So, um, you know, uh, but yeah, I, I think, well, yeah, you can definitely get somebody who into it for sure. Yes, Rick? I agree. You know, it makes me think about this, that some just because you're paying lessons, paying for lessons doesn't even really make you a student, you know? It's, 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 if, if you're not really, really in the game and not really fully there and dabbling with it, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not really, you know, like you're, you're, you know, if, if you're a joker and you're not really, really putting it in, you know, you can't mm -hmm. say that's a bad student. I'm like, you're not even, you don't even qualify as a student. Like if you're not really mm -hmm. doing, just cause you're giving somebody $70 an hour doesn't mean that, that you're, you're a student. Right. You know? Right. You've got to, you've got to have the, a little you know, you've got to put a little, little bit of effort into it. Right. So you know, let, let, you, let's, you are a student, you know, maybe there's some truth to that statement. If the person really is a student, I think that, that, you know, that's my, that's my point. Uh -huh. Like that's not even, you're not even a student, man. You've been to four drum lessons, but you're not even really a student of the instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, do you really study it? Hey, I've, I've been playing drums since I was five years old and, and I, I study it every day, you know, so, so, so I, 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 right. Yeah. You, oh, you, yeah. I think you're always learning. You're always a student if you're in it for life. Yeah. Let, let's, let's take it this way. Cause we've been focusing on teaching and I think we're focusing on teaching because it is, uh, it is our main source of income as a, as a, a player. Um, yeah. I, but into the wearing a lot of hats, um, session work, uh, we've all been paid for session work right we, we you know recording artists selling records right. touring drummers we've all toured and played gigs right. um we don't need to broad brush here but what would you say would be an or i don't mean to broad brush i should say what would be another skill set other than playing and teaching that you think that everybody should have before they say hey i'm going to make this leap of faith and i'm going to go pro as a drummer what would be another skill set networking thank you being able to get your people skills up to where you're able to introduce yourself and communicate and respond and and transfer information between other people that would be thank a you. main skill i think that would be critical that i've used that's helped me connect and be able to teach and play mm -hmm. 
Very that's, good. That's a big one. And our last episode was all about that. If, yeah. For all yeah. of, our, all of our, yeah. our listeners. And then, and then of course, just overall communication skills and public speaking. Yeah. Completely. Communication skills. Yeah. You know, and this, this one isn't for everyone, but if you can learn to sing, man, that's a big that's one. That's going to make you more employable. That can help. That can yeah. help. Yeah. I was, uh, yeah. when I got my cruise ship gig, I answered the phone call and he said, okay, great. Well, we're doing a country band thing. So, and I thought, well, I can play country. I'll be all right. And he said, what songs are you going to sing when I hire you? And I was <laughs> like, I don't, I don't sing. I'm a drummer. And he goes, yeah, but what songs are you going to sing for me? And I was like, I don't think you understand, man. I'm not. A singer. I'm not a singer. He goes, Let me put it this way. When I hire you for this gig, what songs are you going to play? And I was like, Rock and Robin, Devil Went Down to Georgia, and The Chair. And he's like, All right, good. And I got the gig That's because funny. I was willing to sing. Yeah. There ah. you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Clearly, clearly in this day and age, and, and, and what worked five, 10, 15 years ago for people that we might model, I'm going to be successful like my favorite drummer who did this. 15 20 years ago we've got a whole new world now we've got a technology yep. world right. so man I, I you know it can be done anyway but i would say you really want to have your social media skills mm -hmm. tight so that Ideally. has to do with sound and video getting all well, that to, stuff. Be to, to be able to take advantage of the technology we've been anointed with <laughs> <laughs> there it is there it oh, is. Yeah. It, 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 really it, is. it seriously is. That's right. <laughs> it really is. It really is. You know, you guys, I didn't uh, okay. go ahead, Jeremy. Go uh, ahead. I was going to take it in a different direction, but if you have one more thing to say, go ahead. No, it's all you, man. It's all you. Oh, I was just going to point out that uh, James Carter, uh, Carterelli, who's watching on YouTube, he asked a question. Uh, he says he has a student who's been with him several years. He's finding it difficult to come up with fresh ideas for him. I know this isn't exactly on the going pro uh, topic, but I thought we should answer it. Do you guys ever face this sort of dilemma, running out of ideas for your students? Absolutely. I, I run out of ideas for some of my more advanced students and we're running out of songs to play. And so usually it comes with, I turn it back on them and I try to get them to bring back what they want. What they want. What is it that they want to do? What songs do they want to play? And what skills would help them require that would be required to help them do that? Right, right. I, I, I run into that too. And I, uh, what I try to do um, is always have a, a, a wide variety of go-tos um, as a teacher. Uh, for instance, one of the things that Jeremy and I have talked about the Wilcoxon book, you know, uh, I, I like to, I, I, ha I try to have my students working on a few, on a song. I try to have them working at the same time on technique and I try to have them uh, working on an improvisational thing. So there's always like kind of little three areas that we go to in our lessons. Uh, and that's for the playing part of the lesson, because there's so much more to get being a teacher and to drum lessons. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, as the teacher, you need to, I found that for myself, I have to dive deep um, like if a student is maybe not really, they're, they're just killing it on the drum set thing and every song I'm giving them, they're flying through, but they're reading chops and maybe their, their technique isn't up there and I'll turn to the Wilcoxon book. They get through a Wilcoxon solo and they play it great. And then you go, okay, now take that same solo, but you're playing it with a real 16th note feel. Let's swing it. Let's, I mean, the name of the book is Vance swing solos, swing it, you know, or they're swinging it. Now let's square it out. I, I think you've got to kind of um, you got to kind of dig deep within you because I know I do all the time. And that makes you a better player. It makes you a better teacher. There's, as also, well. there's also something to consider too. I mean, we, we don't want to think about this because we're drum teachers and by nature retention, student retention is big deal, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's okay to graduate a student. You know, mm -hmm. oh, sometimes yeah. in my life I've had a position where it's like, okay, he's about as far as I can take him. Let's kick him out for a while and come back in a year or so and see where you're at. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Sometimes. Yep. 
especially if they're interested in a topic or an area of drumming that's maybe not where you're not as evolved with it. You know, like mm -hmm. if you've only you know dabbled with New Orleans second line and you have a student who's really wanting to get into it. Maybe you find who's who is the specialist in the area that you can refer them to. But, you know, yeah. I feel like there, there's honestly, God, there's no shortage of material. I mean, there's so much stuff that I work on that kicks my butt regularly. Um, mm. And there's so many ways you can even take the same stuff that you've been using and, and make it fresh by reinterpreting it. Right. So, for example, right. you know, stick control, which is like one of the foundational books where you're just working on your sticking patterns. You know, you can you can apply for every one of those R's and L's in those sequences. You can assign a different sticking move. You know, every R is a right hand paradiddle. Every L is a left hand paradiddle or every R is a right left left triplet. Every L is a right right left triplet and work on six stroke roll combinations. So on a technical side, you know, you can do that stuff forever. But, you know, you can always get them into transcribing. You can get them into writing their own parts. I've got a orchestral student, and one of his assignments every couple of weeks is to write out a 16 or a 32 bar snare etude of his own. Um, so that, that, you know, just to get them into used to writing and thinking and phrasing. And that's been really fun. Um, that's a really good know, suggestion, getting them into yeah. writing. Yeah. And, yeah. and transcribing. God, I mean, there's no end to what you can transcribe and what you can learn from transcribing. Uh, right. If that's not a skill that they have, you can introduce it, you know, baby steps and get them into it. But, you know, really the, the short answer to what what to work on when you got nothing else to work on is The New Breed by Gary Chester. I mean, that book, <laughs> that, that book will keep keep your students busy for years. Right. You guys know yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So all that stuff is good stuff. And it's hard stuff, though. So yeah. we don't know what level. So James, true. What, what, true. what I can tell you, James, is what's what's worked for me. And I always use music. Um, mm. If you go to my YouTube channel, you're going to find playlists um, of songs by category. Um, you know, you're going to find Bossa. You're going to find um, Tom Shuffle songs. You're going to find, you know, a, a playlist of halftime shuffles. Um and, and what I'd use is just use music. I, you know, I'm going to do a little plug, but, you know, each of my books has the beats in different styles. There's over 400 songs that they could play to, man. So hit DM me and um, I'll send you a copy. If, if, it, if you're in the States, um, you know, no problem to cover the postage. Um, and I'll send you a copy, copy of that. Um, well, that's really nice of you, Rick. Oh, man, I appreciate it anybody who, who who comes on and asks a question man that's that's just we you know that's it's cool. so good to help man yeah. if, 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 if it helps james get more more inspired as a teacher and have more fun that's that's great I, I think i think being a teacher really does involve creating a curriculum man you really have to mm -hmm. to do it well and successfully and have a lot of fun i think you need to have have a curriculum so and, happy to try to be a resource and it's a great reminder that as a teacher, you're constantly evolving too, or you should be. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because yeah. there's so much, I mean, I learn all the time. I learn things, not just like conceptual things from guys like you, but I learn meat and potato stuff, you know, from watching YouTube videos, from getting new books, um, from trying, from watching drummers and trying to figure out what they're doing. Uh, you know, the, yeah. the other one thing I also wanted to mention, and this is something I sometimes I'll occasionally do with my students when they come in and they haven't practiced, or I'll do with some more advanced students um, when they have a little more control is instead of going through the books and the exercises, I'll have them, I'll, I'll throw on like over the course of an hour, maybe 10 different songs. And I'm going to say maybe a couple of these you've heard before but several of these will be unfamiliar to you. And you're going to get to listen to these songs for about 30 seconds. And then I just want you to play. And I want yeah. you to sort of do your best with your instincts to go with the flow. And I know you're not going to get all the arrangement stuff, but you're going to at least try to vibe the groove and the feel and the, and, um, and then I give them feedback on, and then so it's, it's super fun because we get to like get into musical considerations and, you know, what are you listening for and what are you trying to lock into and what's the feel and what's the character of the tune and how can you best yeah. deliver that? And it's like, I feel like in those moments, I can often impart like the best, most valuable stuff I have to offer to them, which is my ears, you know, like on my, right. my own instincts to, to be able to share with them, you know, here's how I would hear this part. Here's how I would approach it based on what I'm hearing. And that just comes from all the years I have of playing on all these different bands and all these different styles of music. And that comes back around to the going pro discussion that we, we started with today, which is like, 
you know, you can sometimes make it in one little area, but you know, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot unless you can play, you know, all these different styles. And yeah. so in learning yeah, to play them, how to make them sound, how to, how to make them feel right. And then you can learn how to teach them and how to talk about them. But then more importantly, you've got all these different touchstones for yourself as a player that you can draw on to apply to any given moment. You know, that's part of what yep. makes Steve Gadd so incredible. And Jim Keltner, guys like that, they just pick the right part because they've got all this exposure to so many different styles of music. That's a huge thing. I have a few students that have become pro and each one of them had to become really good at various styles to make it in different bands to get to the point where they could do their pay their rent while they were doing it. And each of right. them have different various, you know what I mean? Various styles and genres and experience with music and ears and listening while they play. Right. 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 Good point. To the other it, band doesn't, member. it doesn't mean that you can't become expert at one style because that all often ends up happening when you start to specialize. Mm -hmm. That's where you really start to make a name for yourself and like get really deep into the one thing that you do so great. But, right. you know, you've got to still have all these other resources to draw from. Right. Let and me, you could, yeah, you could draw from them. And that's what's going to make you so good as a rock drummer because you learned funk and you learned a little bit of uh, Latin drumming and you just right. pepper that that in so you get your I own agree. voice. Yeah. 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 Let, let me throw this out there because this goes, this is something I'm always interested in uh, as, you know, the quote unquote professional drummer and wearing a lot mm -hmm. of hats. How do you guys deal with uh, s scheduling of students and touring? or performances how do you you know i know how i do it but it's uh but it is always a challenge how do you how do you, how do you deal with that how do you deal with that you stay on top with your schedule on your calendar the calendar sacred if i book right. something in there that's sacred that's 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 it i don't move it and i make sure i give people a heads up you know a, at least a week in advance to let them know hey i got this show i'm not going to be teaching on this day and I keep it all on paper. Right. All right. Jeremy? Bart, you know, that's a really good question. Um, and I, I, if I may, I want to relate a story about my kid. He was taking piano lessons when he was little. And he had a teacher who he, he loved and respected and was motivating him and inspiring him to get practicing and get good at piano. But this teacher would, would cancel his lessons all the time. And mm -hmm. it was always because he had a gig or rehearsal. And you know, I kind of felt like I understood, you know, oh, I'm a gigging musician too. And occasionally I'll have to cancel some lessons, but it got to the point where it was like three out of every five lessons were canceled or rescheduled, uh. you know, and it was like, well, my, you know, all of a sudden my kid's on the short end of that stick of, of priority and that relationship between the teacher and the student that you have as a teacher, that if we're talking mm -hmm. to you, that's so, so important. It's so important. You really have to care and you really have to know, you have to make sure that they know that you care. And if you start, you know, oh, gigs always come first, you know, well, that only works up until a certain point of how busy you get. And then you can't be an effective teacher anymore. Right. Yeah. But, you know, the short answer is it's all about, you know, trust and, and communication and balance. Right. If you have a really good relationship with your students, they're going to understand if you're going to take some gigs, you know, they'll be excited for you. They'll miss a lesson. Right. No big deal here and there. Or you go on tour. OK, I'm going to be gone for the months of, you know, June and July. Okay, well, that's great because it lines up with uh, summer break or maybe it's, you know, January, February. Well, you know, if you're coming back and they know you're coming back, you can give them plenty of stuff to work on for a couple of months. But right. if you're touring all the time and after the, the two months tour in January, February, you're going to go back out in April, May, June, July. Well, you know, what I would do is I'd, if, if, if that was happening to me, I'd say, look, I'm going to be gone for the better part of this year. I'm going to recommend that you start studying with this other drummer teacher for a while, who's going to be more available to you. And you can right. check in with me anytime, you know, we'll have a lesson as you, as once in a while, if you want, but you know, you've got to prioritize the student, the relationship with students while you're balancing out the, the gigging. Very good. Rick. Yeah. I, I, um, you know, I am very, very dedicated to being an educator and, and, you know, I've been 12 years of writing to finish up the four book series. So my free time is writing my method book and I'm, you know, full in as, as an educator. So, um, 
I'd say about 95% of my time is dedicated to teaching and I just gig a little. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's cool of, and, and very important to be a teacher who does some playing so people can go out and go, yeah, man, I could go see Bart Ropley live and that's my teacher and they're all fired up. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a huge thing. But, but for me, I've got to be realistic as about how much time I can, I can dedicate to playing in a live band. So, right. so for me as a player, I'll just, I just freelance. I I'm not in any kind of band <laughs> that calls me and says, we have to have a gig, you know, you've got to be there. So, yeah. um, cause I'm like, I've already fulfilled, I'm fulfilling that with my student base. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's working, working for me. Um, and, and then, um, I, I, I do miss gigging a lot though, but I think if you look at, check out the whole Mike Johnson thing. If you, if you ever know his story, you know, that guy is a full on educator. Yeah. And so I, I, so he's kind of been a little bit of my, a little bit of my role model as far as, as far as that fully committed to it, kind of like a Dom Famulero, you know? Yeah. Right. So right. what so, about you, Bart? But, you know, mine is, uh, uh, you know, what I do is I don't know how you guys take care of your <clears throat> tuitions. Uh, I, I get paid by the month. So I get paid at the beginning of the month for the, that month. And, like Chip said, the my calendar is you know live and die by it. Um, so I know when gigs are coming, and if I have a gig on a certain day, um, I'll say, "Hey, look!" and and I always leave a couple of days a week open, and they always fill up. So I know, like, okay, if I have a gig on a Thursday, um, my but I don't have a gig on Friday. Well, I keep my Fridays open for gigs. So hey, on Thursday the 12th, I'm not teaching because I have a show, but I'm going to teach on Friday the 13th. You know, do you guys want to take a lesson? And since it's Friday the 13th, they scream and say no. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh -huh. but usually the most students will say, yeah, no problem. And then um, and if I know I'm going to be gone for a week, then, uh, you know, I'll just, hey, I'm not going to be here this week. And I and the way I kind of look at that is, you know, most people will take a vacation. So if you're gone for a week, that's no big deal. And my students know that I, I am a, a touring drummer and, and that, you know, hey, I'm going to be gone. And they don't uh, they usually don't care. And throughout the course of a tour, the way that we do it is uh, usually we'll stay in an Airbnb. Uh, like if we're staying in a central location, we'll, stay, uh, you know, we'll stay in an Airbnb and go in and out from it. So I'll work this in for the second time since we've been anointed with the technology. <laughs> yeah. Got it in <laughs> twice. <laughs> I will. Uh, a lot of times I, uh, you know, I, I'll teach from the road. I just take my tablet ah. and I'll tell my students, Hey, look, uh, I'm going to be on the road uh, Thursday through the, you know, the following Sunday, you know, so a week and a half. Uh, but on Wednesday, we're not playing. We we're dark. So I'm going to be teaching on that day. So I'll, I'll load up that day and I'll tell students, Hey, look, um, it's just going to, it's going to be a technique lesson. I'm not going to have a drum set work on the pad. We'll work in. So, so I have this book ready and that book ready. And so when I leave, I take those books with me and, um, and, uh, um, you know, they're there at my disposal and we go about it that way. So that's how I handle it. Bart, Bart, yeah. you have, you know, I have to compliment you, man, because you have the most incredible amount of energy that you're balancing both of them and your organizational skills are just, just so fantastic. And you're, oh, you're thank you. so dedicated, man. You're like, you're like, probably the first guy at the gig and you're, you know, any available time, you're like, let me schedule a student here. And, you know, and then you're practicing all the time too, man. You are, you're well, the real deal, you. dude, man. It's, I, it's amazing. Coming from you, that's a hell of a compliment. And I definitely, oh. definitely appreciate that. I really appreciate that, Rick. Thank you so much. Those are kind words. Um, you mentioned, and I want to, I want to say this real quick to brush on something that we've all been talking about and both Jeremy and Rick brought up today, this, this name and, and, um, and, uh, um, turning on students to another teacher and turning a student over to another teacher. Um, one of the greatest drum teachers that I've had, and he's been right here on the deck with us and everything like that is Dom Fimulero. And, um, uh, Dom, I remember one time in a, uh, 
in a clinic, he was talking about how he refers students to other drum teachers all the time. And you make friends with the other drum teachers in the area because you do that. And he was talking specifically about how he had referred a rock drum student to Bobby Rondinelli. And because of that, him and Bobby Rondinelli uh, uh, made a great working relationship and became great friends. Uh, so if you're a drum teacher, first of all, that you're learning from the best right there, Dom Fimulero. Don't be afraid to refer uh, students to other teachers because that will only help you and it will ultimately help the drum student. Remember, when it comes to teaching, the most important person in the room is the student. The second thing that I think that we have to acknowledge is the drumming community is really sad, uh, but we're lifting up Don Fimulero right now. He uh, put a yeah. posting out yesterday on social media uh, that he has been diagnosed with cancer. And uh, we all love Dom. And Dom is a huge, not only source to go to as far as a drum teacher and an educator. But if you've ever met Dom or talked to him for more than two minutes, you like you feel that after a conversation with him that you literally could rope the moon and pull it out of the sky. The guy is is phenomenal. So uh, we're we're Dom, if you're seeing this or you ever see this or, or anybody watching that knows Dom, you are we're in your corner. And uh, we've been lifting you up with our good vibes, thoughts and prayers. And so uh, our best Absolutely. goes to Dom Familiario. Dom Familiaro. We love you, Dom. You got Absolutely. this. You got this, buddy. You got this. Keep swinging and ducking, Dom. Hey, guys, I, yeah. I'd like to do a quick, like, rapid fire, um, say a dozen ways or more that you can make money as a musician, just to okay. get people, people, um, like, so, so you've taken the leap of faith, but you got to pay the rent. So, all right, we've established you could do gigs, you can teach, you can write books. What else? Recording sessions, okay. uh, jingles. Um, yep. You can, uh, if, if you live in Southern California, or actually, yeah, if you live in Southern California or if you're watching this and you live in Florida, but especially in Southern California, you guys may have heard of this place called Disneyland. <laughs> they employ musicians, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, don't be afraid to go on an audition for Disneyland. Right. Cruise yeah, ships. You can, you can do uh, repairs. Yep, you, can work, repair. you, can, you can do work as a drum tech for a really well-known drummer in your area. Yeah. I uh, just was listening to the Drum History Podcast. I don't know if you guys have checked mm -hmm. that out, but I highly recommend Drum History Podcast. And um, they had an episode on street drumming. And there's players, you know, making livings doing bucket drumming and street yeah. drumming. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you yeah, can work, work in a music in, store, too. Work in a music that. store, right? Yep. I did that for several years in college. Oh. Uh, transcribe. I've been paid to, uh, I had a guy one time, he was, he had a demo. He was a guitar player. He was a guitar player and he had a demo of a song that he had done. And, uh, he had a drummer that he wanted to use, but he, so he hired me not to play the drums on a session, but to transcribe a song from a demo to give to the drummer to play. And I, I, I don't know. I think I made a hundred bucks on the deal. I mean, but yeah, it's transcribing, transcribing. So know your musical, know your software, no software, you know, right. you could teach software. You could learn, you could learn pro tools, learn logic and teach that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give logic lessons, give, give pro tool lessons. I gave a, I gave a tech into, Oh, I got to give a shout out uh, here. And this is a plug for our, our Jacob Sosa. He was in my tech and tune class that I did on Saturday, as was one of your students, Rick. Thank you for Liz referring. Was there. Yeah. yeah, Liz was there and uh, uh, she was great. So in the tech and tune, I covered everything from putting heads on and tweaking stuff in. I talked about microphones and uh, had one of my students who was having some trouble getting the head seated. And Jacob, who was taking the class, he jumped in with some pointers, man. He's a drum tech at a place in Colorado, you know. And, and so be like Rick said, be a drum tech. There's a, there's so much you can do. I have I think a friend. Anything that gets you in the culture too. You could even have a, uh, you know, 
make an investment, start a rehearsal studio, anything that oh, has yeah. you yeah. in in the scene. Yeah, I have, I have a friend uh, who used to work in a music shop where I used, I used to teach, and he uh, runs a business setting up percussion instruments for local high schools. So band directors, you know, they, they, they don't know anything about their instruments and how to maintain them and how to repair them and how to get new ones. So he goes and sets up the timpani and, you know, repairs the xylophones and all that. So oh, he, wow. He's got a business. Yeah. Cool. Wow. That's outstanding. Chip, didn't you do artist relation? I did A&R for a couple companies before. Yeah, for a little bit. But I kind of that was one of those things where it's like many hats. It's just one of the many hats I had to wear. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right there in the industry. It's yeah. you're right I know a couple I know a couple of guys. Uh uh who is it? I know another guy that is that's A and R. I know a couple of guys that do A and R. Joe Hardy, he did A and R for Axis for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um uh no, oh uh uh Nat Scott. Do you guys know Nat Scott? Yeah. He I think yeah, yeah, he he was A and R for uh Audix. For a while, he was the one that signed oh. me to Audix. Actually, oh. yeah, he was he was artist relations for Audix for a while. Oh, you can also so. uh, produce drum tracks for artists that are looking for drums remotely. So yep. if you're set up to do any recording in your home studio or what have you, you can say, "Hey, I provide drum tracks for hire." That's Which I'm going to give myself a sa shameless plug right now. I'm doing that. I'm I'm in the middle of producing an album right now, and uh, I'm getting really good drum tone. So if you need some drum tracks. There you go. Call me, and I will uh, ask Rick Stojak to come up to my studio and play the drums for me, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'll send you his drum tracks. <laughs> oh, that's a all right. Well, thanks for tuning in to Good our time. crazy show this uh, once again on Tuesday. We love having you guys watching us. We love providing content and having a great time hanging, talking shop, and anytime you guys. I can think of a topic or a roundtable or a guest you'd like to hear us talk about or talk to. Please let us know in the notes and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks, everyone.